Good morning and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. Um, Susan, do you have an Executive Director's Report? I do not. I, I guess I would just um, remind folks that we do have a meeting scheduled next Wednesday. The only agenda item is potential vote on the One Care Vermont 21 budget. Um, and as of this point in time, we do not have sc anything scheduled the next week. Um, just keep an eye on our uh, website for any calendar changes or additions. Thank you, Susan. Um, at this point, then, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Elena Barabi and Marissa Melamed to give us an update. Okay. Hello. Good morning, everybody. I will share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. We can. Okay. Um, so Elena Barabee, Director of Health Systems Policy, and I'm joined by Marissa Melman, who's our Associate Director of Healthcare Policy, and we're here to provide you an update on our staff recommendations, given some additional information that we received from OneCare um, in response to our staff presentation that we gave on December 9th. Um, so we'll go through background on the follow-up letter, talk about what we learned, um, you know, share some updated recommendations, and then go through next steps and open it up for questions and public comments. So if you'd like to look at these materials, they're linked here. We issued um, a follow-up letter based on some of kind of the uncertainties and outstanding items that we discussed um, on the 9th. We sent that on the 11th. And then OneCare submitted their responses um, to those questions on the 15th and provided some additional information. Um, and then we reviewed those materials and then you know, updated our recommendations where um, appropriate. So if there are recommendations not in this presentation, it means that we have not changed them um, from the December 9th presentation. So the areas of follow up topics included administrative expenses, so to clarify uncertainties and justify um, growth in some of these expense line items, so to get a better understanding of what was driving that growth. Um, sources and uses to clarify the nature and certainty of particular funding streams. Um, this is an area that we hope to kind of get more standard templates and understanding as we go forward. So that was very helpful to talk through that some more. Um, the CPR program, I believe um, board member Holmes had a question on kind of some of the discrepancies um, in nature of that funding stream. So we did receive a response and felt that that clarified that response can be found in, those, in the one care materials, but did not warrant any uh, recommendations. So we won't go into detail there, but, and then on um, in the fourth area, was um, 2020 projected surplus and losses. So looking for any updated projections and um, talking about you know, justifying the accumulation of reserves to date. Um, and so we have updated some of our recommendations on that front. Um, and then we did have a question on some of the details of the contract negotiations, which um, was determined confidential. Um, and you know, I think that was resolved um, through those um, exchanges. And then in other topics raised by One Care in their response, that was not kind of a direct point of clarification from some staff perspective, was um, an opportunity to discuss the blueprint for health and SASH um, as it relates to the advanced shared savings. So we've included that in our presentation today. What we learned, um, you know, so I think there's this idea that admin salaries are increasing at 18%. I think we just want to be clear what that 18% is attributed to. Um, so really, there's really only 2% salary increase, which is about 3% of the 18%, so 1.4 um, million increase in salaries and benefits over um, the 2020 budget. Um, so, you know, 8% of that is the impact of adding back um, uh, vacancies that were kind of eliminated in the 2020 budget process after COVID. Um, about $600,000 or 7% is the reinstatement of leadership compensation that was temporarily suspended, again, due to COVID. Um, the 2% salary increase, and then now that explains all the variance um, associated with that line item. So we feel that we have a, a good idea of what's happening there. Um, you know, I think this would have been good for us to include in our last presentation, but we just wanted to be clear that the admin budget is really a function, not just of hospital dues, but also 
you know, is half funded by Medicaid, either through the Medicaid contract or DSR funding. Um, there's 16% other, which was, you know, we need to dig into that. I don't, not sure exactly what the sources are um, of the other bucket. Um, but, you know, I think a quarter, the point here is that a quarter of this administrative budget is uncertain if those DSR dollars are not um, acquired. So just something to be aware of. Um, so we updated our kind of outstanding uncertainties, if you will. Um, so I think the relationship between population health management and the admin ratio is still kind of an area that we need to work to better understand. Um, you know, I think we can really look at our guidance process and how we're collecting these data and talk about, um, you know, how do we get to better definitions of true admin versus operating costs? I think one care describes this in there letter back to the board um, and is an area of opportunity that we would like to pursue to really get a better understanding of how FTEs are fulfilling um, or kind of what value they're driving um, in, you know, healthcare um, um, in population health. So clarifying the population health, how salaries, um, uh, you know, align with different population health programs and initiatives, payment reform, um, and other provider support. Um, we did kind of determined that the GMCB bill back was overstated, so we would expect that amount to come out of the budget. Um, again, DSR funding is uncertain, and the self-management contract, um, 261,000 of which shows up in the administrative budget, um, that is also uncertain. So we would recommend that the board, you know, could approve this budget conditional on those funding sources. So this just gives you a sense of how admin expenses have grown over time relative to other um, other um, buckets of funding, if you will, or uses, if you will. Um, this is really a 38% increase over 2018 actuals, 5% increase over 2019 actuals. Um, it's a cut relative to the approved October 1 budget, but an increase um, as compared to the June 16th budget and a 12% increase as compared to the projected 2020 budget amount. Um, so I just wanted to, in total, that's how it kind of fits in with how this budget has grown over time. Next to ask is one point, is 16 million. So this is in millions um, of dollars. Okay, so the recommendation that we proposed on the 9th was to level fund to 2019 actuals. Um, we proposed, you know, an alternate an alternate recommendation that you could conditionally approve the proposed budget with a reduction to the bill back amount um, that was overstated, um, and conditional on the receipt of the DSR funding and self management contract. So that would just require a revised budget submission um, for the board to review if those funding sources were not um, realized. So I will turn it over to Marissa to lead us from here. Hi. Good morning. Thanks, Elena. Uh, so as Elena said, um, we did not ask any follow-up questions on the blueprint funding, but OneCare did um, in their letter back to us respond to our recommendation to apply the inflationary factor to the blueprint funding as has been done in previous years. According to their response, funding the blueprint with shared savings consumes a significant portion of the savings opportunity and expands the potential loss exposure. Uh, which directly impacts ACO participating hospital financials and investments they may make in anticipation of um, earning shared savings. The response, um, the full response is posted and, and on this slide. Um, we do recognize the challenge of ACO participating providers uh, shouldering the contractual risk of non-ACO participants in the blueprint. However, uh, yep, slide 13. Um, we considered a priority that these programs continue to be funded uh, because we know that they are curbing Medicare cost growth, particularly as Medicare beneficiaries have continued to increase. Uh, we don't want to reduce the growth there. The statute and rule that we operate under requires the ACO to integrate and collaborate with the blueprint and the board's original vote to enter into the all pair model agreement anticipated funding this program with the trend factor. Uh, so our recommendation is built on these three points. Whoops, still on 13. Um, we recognize that the um, asymmetrical risk to the ACO associated with investing the advanced shared savings in the blueprint for health and SASH. Um, however, receiving the advanced shared savings brings an additional $8 million plus into the state 
uh, evaluations of the blueprint and SAS suggest these programs generate savings and level funding the blueprint is effectively a rate cut to these programs as Medicare population benefiting from these programs is growing. Uh, slide 14. So we did update our recommendation slightly to say in 2021, one care must fund the SASH and Blueprint for Health, ECMH and CHT investments in the amount of 8.4 million plus an inflationary factor of 3.5%, um, totaling almost 8.7. Uh, this is, and this needs to be consistent with the medical home community health team and SASH program payment designs that's approved by the Agency of Human Services. And that 3.5% is based on the Medicare benchmark growth target over the life of the agreement. Can turn it back to you, Elena, for reserves. You might be on mute, Elena. Yep, okay, I got it, all right. Um, so thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, so for the reserves, um, you know, I think we just wanted to update some language here, um, particularly. So I think we just wanted to clarify that the reserves were really about reporting to the board. Um, so we updated our recommendation um, to include in future budget guidance and reporting manual requirements for one care to report on any changes to its reserves and justification for any growth or disbursement including One Care Vermont's board approved amount and date of board approval. Um, we'll maintain the recommendation that we would like an update on their final 2020 net income and subsequent use. Um, in their letter, they indicated that there was no change to the expected um, zero dollar bottom line. So we'll kind of just, you know, continue to ask that they keep us surprised if there are any changes there. Um, and then we'll keep and update the 2020 recommendation um, around um, notification to the board within 15 days of use of any reserve amounts. But, you know, because this reserve amount was growing and we didn't know about it, I, you know, we eliminated the $4 million um, kind of um, amount there just to indicate that, you know, for any reserve, use of any reserve, we would um, expect notification to the board and that um, we made an adjustment here, which I have to double check, but I think was maybe already part of, um, a revised recommendation in a budget amendment, but to remove the engaging in hospital sustainability planning um, now that all hospitals are engaging in sustainability planning. Um, so that should kind of expand the use or the pool that, that these reserves could be used for. Um, in terms of next steps, you know, we expect the potential board vote to happen on the 23rd. When we come before the board on the 23rd, we will kind of organize our recommendations recommendations and indicate which items would exist in the budget order condition, which items would we would expect to see in a reporting manual, um, and then which recommendations we would kind of work to incorporate into 2022 budget guidance. Um, this would allow us to issue a budget order in early 2021 if the um, board votes to approve the budget. And then um, we would still continue to, you know, look forward to a revised budget um, once the all the contracts are executed and we have the final attribution um, numbers. So that will, that concludes our presentation for today. We're happy to open it up for any questions, Chair Mullen, or as you. Thank you, Elena. And uh, I know that uh, um, one member of the board um, has an emergency situation that will require an early leave. So in order to try to speed things up, um, I'm wondering if, um, it might be best to go out of order and not start with board questions, but go immediately to um, Vicki Lohner at One Care to try to address um, some of the issues that um, there may be misconceptions on and get those out of the way. So for example, Vicki, um, some of the questions might be, um, is anyone other than in a, a low level position going to receive a 2% increase in pay? Um, what maybe you could address the reserve situation and further on the blueprint and sash. I think uh, if you could really detail um, what you're thinking on that issue, I think it would help um, to move things along quickly. 
Great, thank you so much, Chair Mullen. And first, I want to uh, thank the staff at the Green Mountain Care Board. They've been working really hard over the last couple days with our staff at One Care Vermont to seek clarity on um, some of the outstanding questions and to really come to a common understanding about our budget and the intent. Um, we know that this is pretty complex information and even in the best of times when we can sit around a room together and really dig into the details having to do this uh, remotely during a pandemic when I think everybody's stress levels are higher than normal um, can create some challenges in of itself. So I just want to take a moment to thank um, them for their hard work um, over, the, over this period of time. Uh, thanks very much for being able to address some of the questions. I do want to say that OneCare does support the revised um, operations uh, to come back in the spring because we do know that there is some uncertainty around some of the programs such as the DSR programs and the self-management and of course, um, we will adjust for the bill back when that, that number is known. I think we're both in a position of kind of uncertainty on what that number would be. So I just want to put that out there as um, uh, something that One Care would intend to do. So I very much would support uh, approving as is conditionally and coming back in the spring once we have more information. Chair Mullen, in terms of your question around the 2%, the 2% is um, across the board. So every um, employee within One Care Vermont would receive a 2% increase. And that's uh, standard with all of our employment arrangements, um, which, are, which are through the University of Vermont Medical Center. So that is the, the first question. Um, in terms of the reserves, we did intend to keep our reserves level going into next year. And while we do understand that there is reduced overall total cost of care risk because of the pandemic, there's other risks um, that one care could incur, such as if a hospital was not able to repay the all-inclusive population-based payment if there were some overpayment, that is something that the federal government would come to One Care Vermont for and not necessarily um, the individual hospitals because the ACO is the entity that would be responsible to repatriate those, those funds and any overpayments. There's also the situation, and let's hope this doesn't ever happen, where a payer is unable to make a payment to One Care Vermont, or if hospitals are unable to make the level of investments that they're making in uh, population health management. So if we were to think about this as days cash on hand, it's, it's very small, in fact. Um, so we believe that we're kind of at the minimum necessary right now for the reserves and do agree with the language as written that we would, of course, come to the board if um, we needed to leverage those reserves for, for any particular reason. And then the last thing on the blueprint, um, I want to say that I appreciate that um, the staff and the board realized that the way that the blueprint is included in the ACO contract does uh, make for some asymmetry for those uh, hospitals that are taking on the full financial risk for this particular program, as well as continuing to make investments in their communities that are far reaching beyond their own organization and include um, other programs. I just wanted to be clear because there's always some nuance in this. Um, One Care has included the inflationary rate into our overall budget, but our intent was to only apply that inflationary rate to those um, hospitals that are participating in the Medicare program and who are also the hospital administrators for the Blueprint program. 
So this would create a small um, incentive for those providers that are fully participating in healthcare reform efforts. And I do believe that is in line with AHS's um, all-payer model improvement plan to say that we want to create some incentives for participation and value-based care, while at the same time still funding those providers who are either not at all participating in healthcare reform activities at any level and or those providers who are starting to participate but haven't yet um, been able to participate fully in things like Medicare where the risk and reward as well as the overall operational challenges and questions, for, especially for critical access hospitals are still really an open switch. So I didn't want um, this committee to think that we were leaving federal dollars on the table. Indeed, we were just trying to create some modest incentives um, for those hospitals that are that are participating in Medicare and who are also fully participating in the blueprint for a health program. And I would encourage, if we could, to make sure that we maximize, I know it's asterisk at 3.5, but really maximize that federal inflationary rate to make sure that um, the providers have the resources and ability to really continue to move forward in a pretty ambitious goal that we had for the state. So that would conclude my comments, but I'm also happy to take any questions. And I thank the board and the staff for their time and the ability to provide some additional clarification. Super, thank you, Vicki. And I'm gonna start the board questioning in reverse alphabetical order. And uh, Maureen, knowing that you are under a time constraint, if you also um, have a question that you wish to direct to Vicki in addition to our staff, I'll allow that to happen too. Uh, sure. I actually don't have any additional questions. I thought the presentation was was very thorough and addressed the questions that were outstanding. Um, and I'm comfortable with what the staff is recommending. Thank you, Maureen. Tom? Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. A um, little, uh, some more clarity on the, on the salaries. Uh, I'm looking at the Appendix 6.2, which is the income statement. And for 2020 budget, the salary uh, amount was 80.352 million. And for 2020 projected, uh, obviously incorporating uh, the COVID period, it's uh, 8.344 million, which is just a decrease of 11,988 bucks. And so I'm I'm just trying to reconcile that it looks like you came in on budget or you project to come in on budget in 2020, um, uh, and uh, but yet um, in, in the slides are these references to you know vacancies that were held open and leadership uh, uh, compensation that wasn't paid and that that you're kind of building that back in uh, in your 2021 budget. You know, which adds up to the uh, 1.47 um, million dollars. So I, I feel like I'm missing something. Um, it looks like 2020 projected versus 2020 budget uh, uh, um, is pretty much on track. Um, and uh, um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out where we would see in the 2020 budget uh, the these vacancy savings and uh, leadership compensation um, uh, retentions, et cetera. I don't know if staff wants to take that from the Green Mountain Care Board or. Well, I, I just want to say, I think, I, I don't know if that's Vicki or Elena, but um, the if you're referring Tom back to the October one submitted, that's actually not shown in this table 6.2. So it, that tape, that is not showing the um, original submitted 2020. We can work with you, Tom, to, to point you to the missing information. 
Well, I just, I just like to see it because I, the the last uh, operating uh, income statement I have that's that's what it shows. Yep. Um, uh, something that I keep in mind when um, looking at the uh, you know the the impact of the administrative expenses is that when we went through um, the hospital budget process uh, this year on the revenue side, we allowed a overall a 2.7 percent increase. Um, in uh, net patient revenue, FPP, uh, across all 14 hospitals. And if you take out the U University of Vermont Medical Center, that's act and, and, and just look at the remaining 13 hospitals, um, it, it's a four-tenths of a 1% increase. And so, um, you know, my observation is that we're in tough times, and um, uh, I think that the staff recommendation makes sense in that context. It's uh, obviously not a, a perfect plan, but, uh, you know, from maybe the ACO's perspective, but uh, these are tough times and, and the hospitals, which are paying the dues, uh, 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 came in, in in their budget process uh, um, at uh, very meager increases um, and almost level funding when um, you take out the University of Vermont Medical Center. So level funding makes sense to me in a in, 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 in a broad broad context. I also uh, kind of want to um, ask a question um, or at least uh, uh, you know paint an expectation that uh, relative to the blueprint and sash and um, the money there. Um, uh, last year during these hearings, I raised the issue of the benchmark plan and whether or not that benchmark plan was aligned with the population health goals um, that we have um, in the all-payer model and that the ACO, to a great extent, is the uh, point of the spear to lead the charge here. And, um, you know, just kind of looking at the, um, <clears throat> you know, at the uh, 2021 approved premium levels for uh, the QHP plan, um, which is founded on the benchmark plan, yeah, you know, we have over five hundred and forty million dollars of premium between MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield coming in. Um, yet the benchmark plan hasn't been revised since 2012. Uh, it doesn't easily allow for um, uh, pre-diabetes uh, 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 treatments or or benefits, and um, uh, and obviously for 2021, that's not something that that can happen because you know the the, the horse is out of the barn there. But for 2022, um, it does seem to me in in the context of rearranging the self-management programs, which the blueprint does uh, operate or sponsor the best pre-diabetes program that the CDC can remember. Um, that in 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 the realignments here. Uh, looking at the benchmark plan for 2022 uh, may be uh, a source of finding revenues to help the blueprint, um, you know, to, because they become a provider uh, for a pre, pre, a, uh, pre diabetes. So I'm I'm urging the um, ACO to take a look at the benchmark plan, take a look at their uh, population health and, and and quality goals and objectives, and um, come back to the board and say. These are well aligned, and there's nothing to be gained there. Or these are not well aligned, and here are some opportunities that that uh, the ACO and the insurers and Diva can work on to better align uh, the, the application of these premiums, which is a lot of money, uh, toward uh, uh, an approach that is consistent with our population health goals. So that's. Uh, um, in, in terms of the topics that we're discussing today, th those are my my questions and my comments. Thank you. Tom, I did notice that uh, Tom Boris had his hand raised, and I'm assuming that may be to answer your earlier question. Tom uh, Boris, is that uh, why your hand is raised? Yes, it is, thanks. I can speak to the 2020 projection uh, comment a little bit, if that's helpful. So um, going back down memory lane here, we built the revised 2020 budget in the May, uh, early June period. And uh, it certainly felt like the sky was falling at that point in time. So what we did was build in every single savings aspect that we could at that point. And basically that meant we had a budget that was completed sometime in June 
And that became basically also our best projection of the year. So those were done concurrently. That's why you see a lot of similarities between the budget, revised budget we submitted and our projection because they were actually done at the same point in time. Uh, we are now in the process, now that the, the cyber event is um, slowly allowing us to get some resources back, uh, catching up on a couple, couple of monthly closes and um, updating our 2020 projections. I can say I don't expect any material shifts, maybe some timing issues, but nothing of substance to note here. But that's why the 2020 projection and budget look so similar. Uh, thank you for that, Tom. So do you have a, it sounds like you don't have a, a number for salaries uh, for a uh, for a 2020 projection? Not in my hip pocket, but I do know that we're tracking quite close to budget pretty much across the board. So you are tracking close to budget in 2020 projection relative to the 2020 approved budget? That's correct. And did the 2020 approved budget include the um, leadership compensation, et cetera? It did. All of the cuts that we put into place in 2020, the leadership comp, uh, the, the hiring freeze, was, et cetera, was all built into that revised 2020 budget model already. That's why when you okay. compare that okay. revised model to 2021, it looks like there's an increase. We're really just trying to restore yep. those cuts and also give one care the resources it needs. Because from a, a staffing perspective, the amount that we lived with in 2020 was not sufficient for us to keep moving forward and continue okay. to grow these programs. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you, Tom, and thank you, Tom. <laughs> So with that, we'll go to um, board member Robin Launch. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I had a couple of comments um, that I wanted to make. Uh, the, I'm going to focus first on the Blueprint and SASH programs. Um, I did a little trip down memory lane and looked at the Blueprint statute uh, since we last met. And um, I would like to make a suggested change to the staff recommendation to clarify things a little bit. Um, and so in uh, 18 VSA 702 D1C, the blueprint for health is required, it's a shall, to include a model for uniform payment for health services by health insurers, Medicaid, Medicare, and other entities that encourage the use of medical home and community health teams. And so uh, based on that statutory programmatic directive to the blueprint, I like the part of the recommendation that allows for the growth in the blueprint medical home and CHT dollars to for the ACO and AHS to work out how that is distributed. Because I think the statute intends that the blueprint be a multi-payer program with a payment model and programmatic alignment across the different payment sources. So I do like that um, part, but I would personally like to add some clarity around SASH. Um, SASH started as a blueprint program. However, it started well after the statutory enactment. Um, so it's really the statute is silent on SASH. Um, I feel like um, the intent behind the all-payer model agreement and certainly the articulated um, promise, if you will, to that program was that there would be a growth trend for that program over time. And that was one of the benefits that the state was seeing from this new agreement with the feds. Um, however, I think, you know, since the funding stream now comes through Medicare through the ACO program and we are stepping into the shoes of Medicare in regulating the growth in that payment, uh, I think it is appropriate for us to be clearer in that in our order that the expectation is that the the budget for SASH is the budget from last year trended forward with 3.5%. So I think that um, that would require a little bit of a, a tweak or clarification in the staff recommendation when it's translated into budget order language. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there um, 
now so that everybody else on the board would have a chance to think about it and certainly would welcome Vicki's uh, comments. Um, and what I would just say, Vicki, is that it was not clear in your budget submission that your proposal was to trend the money but use it for in a different way. That was not at all clear. In fact, I feel like I am hearing it for the first time clearly today, three business days before we're voting. So um, particularly with these programs, I feel an obligation to delve a little bit deeper because we are stepping into the shoes of Medicare. So we are in a different position than we are doing our when doing our overall budget review as uh, the regulator under the state statute. Um, so I'll pause there to see if Vicki wanted to respond. Certainly you don't have to, Vicki. Um, but I, I'll just pause there and then I'll make my other comment. Sure, thanks Robin. Um, I think that this is all really nuanced and I think we're finally just getting to some common understanding of the blueprint and how that works. Um, so certainly this was a good opportunity for us to be able to get in a similar position. Um, we do still stand pretty firmly that we believe that those incentives should go to those hospitals that are participating in both the Medicare and um, the, the um, uh, blueprint programs. We are funding about half of the funding of the eight and a half goes to SASH already and only half of those communities are actually participating in the Medicare program. So their costs, although they might be driving down state costs, they are not driving down costs for the ACO, so not directly participating in the Medicare program. So I, if, if we have to, if the ACO has to continue seeing that there is this asymmetrical risk, um, providing the same incentive, regardless of whether or not you're participating in payment reform, it, it doesn't provide much of an incentive for hospitals to continue to participate and take on the risk in these programs. So I think it's a modest incentive, but I think it's the right incentive and it provides the right directionality moving forward um, of having you know to consider participating in these programs moving forward. We're certainly not cutting their funding. We haven't seen anything that the program is growing, but it is keeping it flat for the number of participants they currently have right now. And just if I could interject, Robin, for a second and put sure. Susan Barrett on the spot, um, we did reach out to AHS and ask the, them for some feedback on this uh, topic. And Susan, um, do we know when we will get that feedback? I anticipate we'll get something um, from AHS before you make your decision next Wednesday. Um, I know they're they're uh, very busy with the COVID <laughs> issues, so I think um, we're doing our best to turn that around. But I expect to hear um, maybe early next week. Thank you. Sorry about that, Robin. I just wanted no, no, to. That's helpful. That's great. I welcome their feedback. Um, and then uh, the the other place I wanted to make a comment is um, on the admin expense growth, and I'm I appreciate um, and am supportive of uh, reestablishing the the funding for the uh, vacancies. And quite frankly, like my general approach in hospital budgets and our other regulatory is like. It really does not make sense to get into like kind of that level of line item up and down because especially in this budget where so much of it is driven by the payer contracts which are not finalized uh, in time for us to review them as at this part at this point in the budget process. Um, I would say that I did find the messaging somewhat inconsistent uh, because certainly I appreciate and supported reducing hospital dues and adjusting risk in uh, the programs to, um, to reflect the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, however, it seems with the admin budget, then the messaging gets lost and it's as though we're no longer in the middle of a pandemic. So I just 
want to make that comment that I think, um, you know, to, to the staff's point, a big chunk of the admin budget revenue is uncertain. And so it does make sense that uh, we're kind of looking at the best case scenario and that we revisit that in the spring, given uh, the way this process flows every year where we never really know what the revenue is going to look like until after the payer contracts are finalized, which happens after we vote um, at this point. So that was just the other comment I wanted to make. Thank you, Robin. Um, Jessica. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I just had a, a clarifying question. Um, I want to thank the staff for all of the work on the recommendations and all of that. I'm comfortable with them. Um, but but I, the one question actually was raised with Vicki's point. The original submission requested level funding for you know Blueprint, SASH, Advanced Savings, that um, bucket of dollars. But if I understood Vicki's point just now is that there seemed to have been a request, and maybe I'm wrong about this, Vicki, to maximize the federal funding. Was that a request to go higher than the 3.5, um, you know, that's been proposed by the staff now? So I'm actually asking for a clarification on that point, particularly given the asymmetric risk um, therein, and a better understanding of really what the what a pragmatic upper limit might be. From the staff, maybe perspective, but maybe first to Vicky, if I want to understand that. Yeah, absolutely, Jessica. We want to make sure um, that we maximize the federal trend that's available to us. And I might call on Tom. I believe, um, based on the way the contract is written with the state, that we um, we team Vermont um, would be eligible for up to a 4.3 percent increase. Um, do I have that number right? Yeah, and I could just add a little bit of color that that number is sourced from the um, the Medicare Advantage United States per capita cost growth forecast that the CMS Office of the Actuary puts out. Sarah Lindbergh is your resident expert on it. She knows this stuff well, but that is uh, outlined in the Vermont All Payer Model Agreement as uh, kind of a cap or an upper limit on the trend that's allowable under this program. And when we built the and submitted the, the budget in October, we included that full trend on the entire uh, total cost of care, which includes the MAP CP adjustment that is the kind of funding opportunity for the blueprint dollars. Okay, so what you would be seeking would be 4.3 instead of the 3.5 on those blueprint dollars. Correct. Despite the fact that there's that risk that you did talk about in your um, response and the asymmetrical downside risk, that's something that you're willing to live with now with the 4.3. Is that accurate? The way that I think of it is if we, we as Vermont and One Care advocates for this, that we'd like to get the 4.3 into the state as funding for the participants in this program. So I, that, that I think is um, one underlying piece that's important to be clear on. The, the component that's underneath it that's probably more nuanced is that in our budget proposal, we propose level funding the blueprint expenses going out the door and using the delta, the variance between the dollars coming in on the MAP CP adjustment versus the dollars going out to, as an incentive for the hospital participants. It gets complicated in the way that that accrues and the way the dollars flow in the system, but the net difference between the expense and what we bring in under the target is an incentive, small but important incentive uh, for those participants who have committed to participating in the Medicare program. So would they still be blueprint and SASH dollars just variably paid to those participants who are you know, participating in Medicare, but they're still blueprint and SASH dollars just variably paid depending upon whether you're participating in the Medicare component? I think that they could be considered that way. It's, it's really whether we pay them out as blueprint and it helps in their overall economics at the end of the year, or we use it to help balance their settlement to at least offset to some degree the asymmetry that that chart showed um, is fine to me. But that that's the conceptual approach here is that we're trying to help protect the financials for these participants in the Medicare program. Can I ask a question, Chair Mellon? Um, yes. yes. So, I mean, I think this is new information to staff. Um, 
and I think that we would need to understand where this, because you proposed to level fund the blueprint in your submission, that baking in this 4.3 must show up somewhere else. That was not taken into consideration, nor was it communicated clearly to staff. Um, so I think we would need to know where that shows up on your income statement to understand what the impact would be on your budget of taking that 4.3 out. I mean, because our recommendation is to apply the growth and keep it in the blueprint in the SASH program. So, I mean, and I think getting some clarity on if it is variable payment, like board member Holmes was asking, if it stays at the blueprint or SASH, or if, so does that mean that they get in effect um, a higher variable payment than the amount because the number of providers is fewer, or is it that um, you're taking that money and putting it elsewhere in the budget? Because I think the math, there's still some uncertainty there. So uh, Elena, if I could just be s simple about this and then Tom can get more detailed if needed. It's always included the 4.35, but the, the four point, that, that percentage increase is going directly to the hospitals who are also the administrators of the blueprint for health. So it's going directly to them. So we're not spreading it to SASH or um, other patient centered medical homes going directly to the hospitals. So let me phrase it a little bit differently, uh, Vicki or Tom, um, following up on both uh, Jess and Elena. Um, what guarantees do we have that the hospitals will use that increase on healthcare reform efforts? And besides Blueprint and SASH, what, what would be the uh, spectrum of possibilities? Well, to the first question, um, the way that that essentially works is by getting the trend on the MAP CP adjustment and the entire target, which is Vicki's correct. It wasn't when we built the budget, we included the full 4.35% trend on the entire Medicare target, which is inclusive of the claims components for the ESRD and the non ESRD cohorts and the MAP CP adjustment. On the expense, what is an actual expense for one care are the blueprint costs. We write checks every quarter for SASH, community health teams, PCMH. What's tricky in there is the difference between those materializes that settlement. It helps the final settlement of the program when we net out with Medicare, because we have to account for that MAP CP adjustment at the time of settlement, particularly if we got an advance of the cash and it helps offset costs or increases the amount that the potential participants can receive in shared savings. I know it's technical. It's a, this is the most complicated aspect of the One Care budget, which is why we're having this conversation today. It's very difficult to explain, but. So let's be today, less technical and let me try to rephrase it a different way. Um, is there a possibility that um, the increase that um, went out um, would would just be uh, kept to reduce dues rather than be used on reform efforts? I mean, I would think that would be counterproductive to trying to bring down total costs of care in order to maximize your potential savings opportunity. So with any of these reform efforts, the hospitals, providers, FQHCs need to do everything they can to really maximize those care coordination and prevention efforts. We, of course, can't dictate, you know, I think you'd find across the board um, that blueprint dollars are probably used in very different ways from one practice to another, but it would hurt um, the hospitals who are taking risks if they're not really maximizing those prevention and care coordination efforts. What prohibits you from dictating to make sure that the blueprint dollars are specifically used for population health and reform activities? I think um, the challenge, Chair Mullen, is that the blueprint for health um, is not with under the control of One Care Vermont. So this is a state, as Robin indicated, this is a state-run program and they kind of dictate the terms and requirements and evaluation of the programs. This is something that sits on our contract, which as we're having this discussion today, really does 
complicate things when not everybody is actually participating in the Medicare program. Um, so I would say this is fully within the control of the Agency of Human Services. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Jess, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, I appreciated those questions. Um, that, that was my only question, so thank you. Okay. Can so I just this, make one more comment? Absolutely. Kevin, um, you know, I, I am open to having a conversation about uh, how to better align the incentives between the ACO program and the Blueprint program. However, I would be a lot more open to it if it if you had if we'd had this conversation as part of your budget discussion and not three days before business days before the vote. I'll just tell you, it's like it's it's too late in my mind to try and really fully understand and get the necessary stakeholder impact to understand this proposal, which was not clearly made at the budget presentation. So. Uh, you know, I'm in future. I'm I'm open to having a more robust conversation about this, but um, it to me like it just reinforces that our order needs to be clear on what goes out, both the trend for what comes in and the amount that goes out, at least for SASH. And as I said, I'm willing to leave it up to AHS as you know the person the the agency responsible for the blueprint to work out how the remaining dollars are used between uh, the ACO and AHS. So it just sort of reinforces my position, to be honest, because I don't feel like we can really do a good job um, on this topic at this late time. So I appreciate that, Robin, and I, I would just say that um, I'm not feeling the pressure that if we don't have all the necessary information, to actually vote next Wednesday. Um, I think that we need to to get all the information and make the right decisions. And so um, I would hope that uh, we do have enough time to completely um, dissect this, this uh, issue and come to a firm decision by next Wednesday. But if we don't, I'm also not feeling pressured to make that decision next Wednesday. So um, that's just one board member. <laughs> Other members of the board? If not, I will say that we're way ahead of where I thought we would be at this point in time, but I'm gonna open it up to uh, public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to make a public comment on the ACO budget discussion? Another very quiet uh, day. Uh, maybe Fridays are the day to have meetings. I don't know. <laughs> um, with that, then I guess, um, is there any old business to come before the board? Chair Mullen, this is Susan. Can I just add one thing that um, I, very minor, and the, the agenda for next week also has a, um, a potential vote for the Medicare benchmark. I, I failed to say that earlier, so. Thank you for clarifying that. And uh, not hearing any old business, um, before I go to new business, I neglected to um, uh, uh, appropriately thank staff, Elena and Marissa, and others uh, working behind the scenes uh, on this. I know this has been uh, a very challenging and difficult process, um, but at the end of the day, we need to dig deep and we need to fully understand exactly what um, we could possibly be approving. And so um, your efforts are greatly, greatly appreciated by all members of the board. And we know it's not easy um, working those long hours, um, especially during the holiday time. But if there's any advantage to a, a, a COVID year, it's that sometimes it seems like work takes our mind off of uh, other things. So. We're very, very thankful to you, Elena, and thank you, Marissa. And if you could extend our thanks to the other members who have been working with you, we are deeply grateful. With that, is there any new business to come before the board?
Tom, there was a little bit of noise coming your way. Was that uh, new business? <laughs> I guess not. I, mean, I was preparing to make a motion to adjourn, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, you may proceed, Mr. Pelham. <laughs> Well, ask the question, Mr. Chair. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, there is. I so move. Is there a second? Second. 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 It's been there. moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. And I know that um, um, the One Care team and the staff will continue to um, really hammer down the, the final uh, um, understanding so that uh, we all can accurately and um, confidently know um, what we are voting on before we vote on it. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great weekend.